Well, welcome to this uh, Bon Solon interview for Expert Witnesses. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Cara McKeown, who is the chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Welcome. Thank Carrie, you. do you want to tell us a little bit about the Academy? Uh, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges is an umbrella organisation that looks after um, uh, and represents all medical royal colleges on cross-cutting issues. So basically we represent all 220,000 doctors in the UK by and large. So big organisation. And um, let's talk about expert witnesses, that's uh, what we're here for. Why are they important? Expert witnesses are important because it's recognised that they provide a very important aspect of starting uh, a, a case or continuing a case in cases of medical negligence. And this has become apparent largely because of areas where it's been shown that they have not been able to carry out the, the role adequately. And I think it's right to say that many expert witnesses come as healthcare professionals, don't they? So this is actually very important. Um, now, in the past, there's been no over overall guidance for experts. What has the Academy done about that? Well, we're looking at... The, we've just, we have provided some new guidance, which followed on from the Sir Norman Williams report into gross negligence manslaughter. And that guidance um, was requested following that report um, because it became recognised during the evidence that was given that some expert witnesses were not aware of their roles and responsibilities and in some cases there had been a miscarriage of justice and there had been a number of issues round about that so it was considered that it was important that we looked at this, looked at whether training was involved, needed to be involved or whether guidance needed to be given. And I think the guidance came out in May 2019 yeah. and that's acting as an expert or professional witness, guidance for healthcare professionals. And that's on your website, isn't it? That's it is on our website, yes. Um, is it a long document? No, it's a very short document. There, there's quite, there are a lot of um, people involved in, in, in helping us with it, um, and they get a lot of credit. So the, the actual meat of it is, is extremely it's short. about 10 pages? No more than, yes. Now should people read that? Yes, they should. Because? They should read it because it is up-to-date guidance. It has been endorsed by more than 70 healthcare professional groups. It's four nation, UK, and it has been approved by the, um, the, the Medi General Medical Council and other regulatory bodies that are so involved in this So it's both the professional bodies and the regulators involved in healthcare professionals. They recognise that this work is important. But can I ask, we have the civil procedure rules, the criminal procedure rules, etc. Why do we need more guidance? The reason that we need guidance is largely because, first of all, medicine is a complex area. It's, it's highly specialised and it is difficult sometimes for people to recognise their relevance in a case, particularly lawyers who are instructing. They may not understand the subtleties of different areas of, of medicine. Um, one a teaching hospital surgeon is not the same as a peripheral hospital surgeon doing, uh, doing work under difficult circumstances and so on. So that needed to be recognised. Um, it's also important to recognise that it's very fast moving. Medicine sure. doesn't stop and therefore it was felt there should be guidance around about how long somebody should be in practice, whether they should have a licence to practice, whether they should still be working um, or in historical cases recognised for the time that they were working. So there were issues around about that that was felt that needed to be, um, needed to be highlighted um, but also the recognition that some expert witnesses were not aware of their roles and responsibilities, they didn't understand their neutrality, they didn't understand uh, the requirements that they had uh, to the court and, and to, to, their, um, to the, the person that they were, they were involved with um, and it was felt that that really needed to be highlighted for the medical profession itself. And it's in plain English? Absolutely, plain English. So it's I can even doctors it. can understand it. <laughs> That's right. Um, now, just simplifying perhaps some of the things you said there, I think it's right to say there are two roles. There's the day job, if I could call it that, of being a doctor, and then the second, which is a skill set yeah. of being an expert witness, how to write a legal report, how to court, how to court yeah. the law and procedure. Does the guidance apply to both, or what's the 
What does it say about those two different roles? It, it's holistic evidence, uh, um, sorry, guidance, um, where it, it deals with the doctor as a doctor and sure. where they should be, but it also indicates very clearly that they need to know their roles and responsibilities in that role as an expert witness. And that being an expert in a field of medicine doesn't naturally make you an expert uh, as far as the courts um, or as far as providing a report is concerned. And you need to understand what the, the, the terms of reference are around about that before you can do it. So I think it's right to say that it's, uh, the guidance is in addition to the civil procedure rules and the protocols and the court rules, isn't it? Yes, it's not it to replace is. them. It so is. they still need to know Yes. The legal requirements. Yes, uh, and in fact the document does indicate very clearly that there are other areas um, that people need to, to recognise. This is just very specifically around about the, the, the needs of the medical healthcare expert around about yeah, being a healthcare professional in that field. So uh, it's a useful guide which has to be complied with, but there are also the court rules that have to be followed as well. So it's, it's not just you can rely on the guidance, you've got to follow the whole legal system really, haven't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. So what does the guidance say about the training of experts? You mentioned about training a moment ago. Well, what it recognises is that, um, as I said, that people can't do this just as enthusiastic amateurs, and in fact, training around about what's expected of them and what their responsibilities are is essential. But there's no details around about exactly what that training should or shouldn't be. And why, why, is, why is that? Because we, again, because we're, we're medical and we don't want to be involved in providing um, le appropriate legal training, which is effective what this amounts to for, um, for medics. So just going back to the beginning again, what concerns have been expressed about experts in the past before this guidance? Was brought into full. Well, the the, ev the the information that was we got on the um, the gross negligence manslaughter report indicated, firstly, that the police um, initially who were who were looking for an expert witness didn't know where to go, um, and they often ended up going to people who possibly were not appropriate. Right. And occasionally, they did not recognise their responsibility and tended to give slightly biased evidence which was which was either going for the prosecution or for the defence rather than having a neutrality and there were cases that they recognised that went much further than they would have done had they had a neutral and informed expert witness that would have either stopped something in its tracks or taken it on to the next natural stage. The CPS also indicated very similar um, problems and I think that we all recognise that there have been uh, miscarriages of justice, waste of court time, um, and a number of cases that have recognised that the expert witness has not been somebody who has been able to, to give the best based on their professional um, position. So what you want to try and do is get rid of the amateur expert? Correct. If they're going to do expert witness work, they need to know what they're doing, follow the guidance and everything we said earlier. That's correct, and do it properly. And do it. And so there's no doubt from the point of view, it's useful I think also for, for lawyers who are instructing uh, that they can recognise that these issues that they maybe were not aware of before are, are all high rele highly relevant. You mentioned earlier that both the professional bodies and the regulators have approved this guidance, which is great. Um, what do regulators now expect from experts? Well, I think if they we haven't had anything to see exactly what they would expect, but generally, if a regulator is looking into a, a concern or any area of misconduct, what they would do is they would ask the question, have you complied with the guidance? And if you haven't, why not? And that would become part of an investigation. Also, of course, revalidations re re are really important, particularly for doctors, yeah. isn't it? So there's a regular checking that they're up to speed with things. Yeah. Would Fairly to comply with the guidance if they act as an expert witness be part of that revalidation process? Well, it should be. Um, appraisal and revalidation for doctors should reflect their entire practice, which includes, includes. clinical and non clinical work, and therefore um, it, that should be something that's picked up at their appraisal and therefore part of the revalidation process. You also mentioned um, continuing professional development. That healthcare professionals who act as experts need to carry on with CPD requirements. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Well, 
as you said, everything moves very quickly in this world and training is very useful uh, to have as a basis, but it is changing and people have to demonstrate that they're keeping up to date. Because law changes, practice changes, yeah. so it's not just I've read the guidance. Exactly. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. They have a responsibility. Um, now, so, some experts have written into us about this guidance because we've circulated it already. And um, one of the things is, um, I've retired. Mm -hmm. uh, can they still act as a, an expert witness? Well, first of all, I've got to be clear that this is guidance. It, it, it's not something, we, we're not a regulator in any way at all. Um, and therefore, that would be a decision that came between the, the instructing solicitors of the court um, and, and themselves. But basically, it, I say medicine moves quickly, law moves quickly, people have to be involved and know what's going on. If it was a historical case, then it may be that they're the best witness because they were involved in healthcare at that time. For but example, it, obstetrics. Yes. It could well be. Yes. Exactly. Some of some of the cases that, that, that are yeah that are older, some paediatric cases and so or on. So um, it would be it's appropriate that you Knowledge choose somebody time. who's been involved at the time. But I think they have to be very careful and clear about why they would be involved in a current case if they've been out of practice for a number of years. So it sounds like it's case specific. That's very much the case, yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. The, the, and I think that's been one of the things that came out very, care, very, very much from the, particularly the CPS. Um, they, they weren't really very sure that the person was appropriate um, because they don't recognise the difference between one type of paediatrician and another uh, or one type of obstetrician and another. And there are quite significant differences. We've also had experts that have been doing expert witness work for many years, but they've never had any specific training as you define it. Can they still carry on? Do they need to look at the guidance? Do they need CPD? Well, I think that they need, certainly need CPD. Um, there's no doubt that people can learn as they're doing things and no doubt sure. that they have picked things up as they've gone along. And if they've been doing the job for a long time, they, 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 they are probably very good at it. But I think to demonstrate that they're still continuing to learn and keeping up to date is important. Sure, and just some of the things from the actual guidance itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, do experts need to be aware of the wider context of the care delivery as it affects issues in the case? Yes, absolutely. Um, it is not possible really for somebody to be able to give an expert opinion on something that is out with their 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 day to day work. Um, it, they may do a completely different different job. In addition, they also need to recognise where they sit within the wider medical interpretation of um, of. Of, of, of practice because again as with everything there is there, there, there is a range and I think it's important that they can recognize that they're at one end or other end of a range and where they sit within that so, so they, they should give good they opinion. should express a spectrum yeah. of opinion if yes. that is not black white it could be gray absolutely and I think they need to recognize that they're representing they're not representing themselves really in many ways they're representing their profession uh, and what the the current evidence and the current practices within that. But of course their duty is to the court. Indeed, yes. Um, should experts set out their area of expertise? You mentioned that these two areas of day yes. job and expert witness. Well, we have recommended in the guidance that, um, th that each expert witness provides a statement um, of their their ability to be an expert in a particular case. And that includes their medical expertise, but also their expertise um, as being trained as a, as a medical um, expert, as, as we've discussed earlier. Um, what if experts give misleading information? Well, I think that's really something for the, for, for the court. I, that I, I, I wouldn't really be able to give a, a, any, sure. any useful information about that. So what should experts do now? They've watched this video, they've heard what you had to say. What should they now do? Well, I think they need to, to read the guidance, sure. which hopefully they have done, um, and recognise where, um, where they are in that, if they're complying with it, which I anticipate many are complying fully with it. But um, if they're not, they should be asking why they're not and how they can remedy that. So it could also affect their CVs as they attach the reports, yeah. the background, yes. and also their websites, presumably if they... Absolutely. I think, that, I think if, if they demonstrate um, very clearly that they are complying with it, it makes life easier for themselves and f so, for So should, should experts actually put in their reports 
I've complied with this guidance. If they can comply with it, I suspect yes, that's probably quite a good thing to do. Um, okay, I'm, being a, I'm a solicitor. I've got a, a, an expert witness, doctor in the witness box. I say under cross-examination, have you followed the guidance? They say no. What do you think the consequences might be? Well, I think as the question really is, are you try, if you're discrediting a witness, as they would might which expect. is what you would be expecting to do, then I think that the, the, the court would would hopefully take that into account. And the question would be why why not, and it, and therefore does that make you uh, an appropriate expert witness? Uh, well, I think that's really helpful. So I think that the, the main issue is. It's short, it's in English, you need to know it, read it, comply with it, make sure you mention it in the right places. Is there anything else you want to tell the listeners? Um, no, I think that it, this is something that hopefully will make sure that people are getting the appropriate advice, both from the expert witness point of view, from the lawyer point of view, but most importantly from the court's point of view. Good, well Karen, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching, thank you.